we're so thrilled at the gallery to have this opportunity to bring contemporary artists who are represented in the gallery's collection uh, to speak every year annually uh, at the Elson Lecture. And we're particularly uh, delighted this evening to have Mary Kelly uh, with us uh, from Los Angeles um, in her studio. And I know many of you uh, are familiar with Mary's work. Uh, she's a highly distinguished artist, well known for her writing as well as her um, infamous uh, narrative installations and large projects that she's done all over the world. Um, she has a fascinating background um, and is truly among the global artists working today. Mary was born in Iowa in 1941 and she lives and works in Los Angeles now where she is currently the Judge Widney Professor at the USC Roski School of Art and Design. Um, this is following a long tenure um, from 1996 to 2017. She was the Distinguished Professor of Art at the School of the Arts and Architecture at UCLA in Los Angeles, where she actually founded the interdisciplinary studio area. She holds degrees in music, studio art, and art history um, from the College of St. Teresa in Winona, Minnesota, and the Pius XII Institute in Florence, Italy, um, as well as a certificate of painting from St. Martin's School of Art in London and an honorary doctorate of the arts from Lund University in Sweden, a, a great honor. And in between her studies in Italy and London, she lived and worked in Beirut in the early 60s, which I find fascinating and I, I hope we can find out more out about. Um, her work has been extensively displayed internationally in solo shows as well as group exhibitions and biennials, most recently at the Tate Britain in London in 2013, the Palazzo Reale in Milan in 2015, the Tate Modern um, in London in 2016, and just last year at the Museum of Modern Art in a very fascinating exhibition, um, looking at artists uh, working with subjects around issues of war. Um, a conceptual artist and a writer, um, Mary has, addressed, has been addressing ideas concerning identity and sexuality, history and memory um, throughout her career. Um, she's been a central figure in discussions of feminism and art, and her practice incorporates personal residue and material processes of daily life that inform her political reflections. Um, and we'll have the opportunity um, to look more closely at those works um, shortly. Um, Mary, why don't I turn it over to you? And it'd be great. I know we ha rarely have this opportunity at a lecture like this to see an artist in her actual environs of her studio. Mm -hmm. So maybe you'd like to tell us a little bit about what's behind you. This is the upstairs of my studio. It's more like my office. And in these days of remote living, it's become a TV studio. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> kind of behind me are some umbrellas that I used as props in a photo shoot for work I did for the Desert X Biennial in 2019. And I'm going to begin with the work postpartum document from 1973 to 1979. In the first slide, you see an installation when this work was brought together again at the Generali Foundation in Vienna uh, under the very interesting curator, Sabina Breitweiser. When I show the installation shot, I always say this is a, is a typical Mary Kelly shot. If you want to um, think about uh, the fact that you can't really see much. <laughs> and this suggests to you my kind of antipathy for the monumental gestalt style aesthetic, perhaps of, of a lot of the minimal art of the time. And my, the influence at the time on me was film. I hung out much more with people in the, in the film world and I wanted to do something in the installation that was not so much like the use of duration in most conceptual art of the time. I wanted to draw the spectator in and through a, a kind of uh, narrative and something that unfolds and really works as an after image. Uh, the postpartum document was in six sections over a number of, of years. And my interest in real time, in cinematic real time, has this kind of converted to working on 
something for the exhibition space meant that the, it takes on a kind of documentary or evidential form. Uh, here, what you're looking at are 28 uh, units, each one with a food, a chart of what I was feeding my son and uh, a stained nappy liner. This is before disposable diapers <laughs> on the surface. Now to get to, to that point, you, there's a lot that I would have to say about why, did, why I did a work like this. In coming of age with other conceptual artists like Kasuth, for example, and Art and Language in London, um, <clears throat> I had felt that there was something that needed to be engaged that didn't fall into what Kasuth would call the analytical proposition, which is art that refers to itself. And because it was the 60s, and because there were all the social movements of the time, um, including the women's movement that I was very much involved in from 1969 on in London, where I was living then, I thought <clears throat> there's something about that proposition that needs to shift and that <clears throat> we should address the synthetic uh, nature of the way that art is affected by life. Now, um, <clears throat> when I first did this work, it caused a great scandal <laughs> in the media. And I ended up um, in, the, in the newspaper just saying, well, it's art because I say so, <laughs> which is like the perfect Kasuth <laughs> proposition. Uh, but <clears throat> what was surrounding this moment, the intense debate, it, you, people would practically get into fist fights talking about this, this work at the time. And <clears throat> I felt that, why was it that we had in art history, nothing that really dealt with the most probably universal experience of women from their point of view, only sentimental kind of images of women. So to, to put that together with kind of my interest in in conceptual work, I wanted to show <clears throat> that there was something that you could address in the interrogation of the object. Of course, we all remember Lucy Lippard saying, you know, the dematerialization of the object, and that was the first group of questions around the object. Uh, but then the interrogation moved to examining itself, you know, in, in works of certain artists, you know, kind of like Kazu. And so I said, well, if you're going to go there to examine the interrogation, then you've got to talk about subject formation. You know, this is, we have to talk about the fact that you're taking your place in language and culture as a sex subject, right? To talk about sexual difference and other forms of difference that <clears throat> accrue in the discussion of that debate. <clears throat> so, I didn't really know what I was up to in the beginning. I just, I thought because of other projects that I'd done that involved uh, women in low, in low paid work in the film Night Cleaners and then another project I did, I was very fascinated by the fact that they told me nothing about their work at all, only what they did at home. The exact opposite of all the men we interviewed who told us what they did at work and nothing about what they did at home. <clears throat> so when I was having a child myself, I kind of said, okay, I'm gonna see what this labor is. I'm going to document it. Uh, I'm going to document everything that I feed the child. And the only way I know if I've done a good job is by what comes out, <laughs> which allowed me to think much more about the psychological investment the mother has and not just to treat it as something to do with domestic labor. I realized that there's that kind of uh, narcissistic involvement with the child who is once a part of yourself. And that it isn't just the child that's separating from the mother in order to take their place, you know, as a speaking subject. It's the mother who's practically, you know, captured in this imaginary relation and has to rebuild her relationship again. <clears throat> and her allowing the child to separate. So going to the second section, 
it was obvious in the first one that you have to feed the child sometime. Breastfeeding is not enough. So there's an obvious moment of separation that you can see. But there's something else that's a little more subtle going on, which is how the child learns to speak and how that's also another moment of separation for the mother. And you can see each section is introduced with a, a kind of um, diagram that comes from this case from linguistics, where a lot of linguists said that the child's single utterance is like a conceptually complete sentence. So if they say mama, <laughs> you mean that can mean many things. But there's actually a moment when they start putting two words together, but they aren't meaningful in the sense that one's just a nonsense word. And that really throws the mother because she's supposed to be the go-to person to tell you what the child wants and what they're saying. So I asked a lot of other women, yeah, did you experience this? And they said, yes. And then I found out only retrospectively that this is what linguists call a, a hollow phrase. <clears throat> right or uh, not just the conceptually completeness of the single word, but a pivot is a word that shows the child's got the propensity to speak grammatically. So that means that just as a child's learning to lose the system on their own, or his or her own, it's distancing the mother's role in that, that one. So then you see, I thought, I want to, to set this out in a material way that gets across the affect in the same sense that the, the nappy liners did, as we call them, or the diaper liners. And so I, I just, I set the words out in type here. They have to be printed to be read. It's kind of a little mirror reversal. So in that series that you just saw the installation, there, there are 23 sections and they mark that passage from the single word to the combination. And so like the first section where I was introducing solid food, it marks another passage where the child is separating, where the mother is trying to make sense of the loss. And what it showed me is that how the idea of you know, the feminine linked to the maternal was able to make something like the social sexual division of labor look completely natural and expedient <laughs> because we have this investment in it. Uh, this time it's introduced with a diagram, as you all recognize, that comes from art. It's a drawing perspective. But if you go to the first detail, my perspective here is these are little drawings that he made on sugar paper in his preschool which took a lot of nerve on my part to think while well, I could write over them. It took a long time to think that. But my perspective is like A, B, C, D, the object to be drawn here. It's just the little fragments of the conversation that I tape recorded. And then where you see the next column, I play it back and say, um, hmm, why, why was he doing throwing my slides off the table, for example? Why the transgression? Then the next column is me thinking about it maybe a week later. So what, what you've got here is uh, another kind of perspective, which is kind of uh, in the psychoanalytic sense, it's like the, the vanishing real in the sense of what's real for the subject. But the key point here, the distance point in my perspective schema is the father, not necessarily the real father, but it's like I say in here, if you do that, I'll tell your father. <laughs> and so it's, it's this invocation of a third term that really marks a, a psychological separation in, in the kind of triangle of mother, father, child, or other. It doesn't have to be the biological father. Just somebody, something that figures in the schema of maternal desire that makes that moment. Um, important for the child. <clears throat> in, in the fourth section, uh, you see it's again, it's Leonardo's diagram on how we see objects. And he was so prophetic in the way that he said, at the horizon line, we vanish. <laughs> really, it's always kind of es escaping. So that's very close to the kind of psychoanalytic definition of 
a, a reality that is in some sense very subjectively formed. Now in the detail, you see, I, I use just a, a plaster imprint of his hand, uh, very much like those things you made everybody, parents, <laughs> when you were in preschool. And then it's a fragment of his comforter in which I wrote narratives about just how I felt when I was away and how anxious to get back. And just that around the age of two, when you, you notice a lot of women have another child because there's something about losing the first one here, which is, is um, confusing in a sense. There's the pleasure of the child's body you know, the, the little body, right? And there's his transitional object, and then there's my transitional object, his comforter, and my little object that represents that best. So I thought to myself, well, it's just, it's more than that. It's also about the pleasure of being like your own mother, <laughs> you know, in, in that moment. So there were many kind of layers uh, here of, um, I would say, of subjective investment in this moment of childcare that threw me way off the path of just, you know, oh, this is about domestic labor. <laughs> and I think this is, um, if you go on to like the next one, uh, this was the hardest one for me to figure out if you go to a, a detail because he was bringing me strange things like bugs and, and then he'd say things as you can read here like, don't I have a baby? <laughs> or, you know, all the, the questions about, about sexuality and really not about the natural world. And of course, as we know from Freud, this doesn't have to be um, <laughs> worked out on a biologically consistent <laughs> basis at all. But what's important in the schema, the epistemological schema, is just that you have a system of difference. The child needs to put in place that difference well, I was thinking, when he asked the question, there's no really good answer. So there's just a fragment of, from a dictionary of childbirth and childcare with a lot of terms. But you've noticed with this child of that age, you could tell them the difference, you know, like, no, you won't have a baby because you're a boy or something like that. Doesn't make any difference. They only acknowledge these things when they want to, or when they made their decision. Uh, and it doesn't have to be, as I say, a kind of logical one. But on the part of the mother, <clears throat> it's also a moment of reckoning, you know, that you're kind of placed again in the generic kind of category of the woman, not necessarily the all-powerful mother that can you know, satisfy all demands, but really the one whose secondary social status is now kind of obvious again. What became the last section in the work uh, I didn't know it would be the last one, but if you go to a detail, this is about writing. And it took, there are 15 pieces in this because it took 15 letters for him to try to write his name. And I realized this would have to be the end of the work because he was the author of his own text, if you like. I couldn't go further. But for me, uh, all of the work is set out as a kind of parody of museological presentation, and this one being the most obviously like the Rosetta Stone that I went to the British Museum and, you know, saw when they made it. But I made it in a very, uh, a lot of my processes are done at home, very low tech. It's like I made a foil out of kitchen foil, a plate on which I could inscribe, copy his, his letters, I could insert it into a little table I made so they'd be protected while I wrote out the fragments from the, in the Rosetta Stone, you, you see uh, the demotic, where the demotic would be, we have the fragments from the, the children's book, where the Greek would be below it. I typed in about him starting, starting school. And then that was cast in resin and slate filler on a slate to make this kind of <laughs> from Zeta Stone, I guess. And the materiality of, of um, all of my work is, is very important. And I was saying to Shelley, one 
good thing about this virtual presentation is you get to see it a little more closely than in a big projection, but the very best encounter from my, from my point of view is with the actual object. I actually think there's something so archaic about the presentation of objects in the museum that it can be kind of restorative in the way that Walter Benjamin talks about, you know, the outmoded at a certain point becoming redemptive. So there's something about the feeling of the work, which my speeding along here describing it doesn't get to in the same way as just your uh, encounter with the stuff, right? So I'm going to keep up this pace, <laughs> which is, and to move very far ahead uh, to the Ballad of Castro Rajepi, which is a work I did in, in 2001. Like postpartum document, you're saying that installation chat, what am I looking at? <laughs> and again, for me, it's all about walking around in this time-based encounter. What you're looking at is what it's kind of laid out like a transverse sound wave <laughs> with the voice running through it as a rest line. But it's materially made of lint from my dryer. This is actually the shape of my Maytag filter screen. And the, the narratives, I do most of the writing myself. And this is a, a ballad, um, an anti-ballad as it were, <laughs> not the heroic bloody the kind that are involved in national allegory. <clears throat> but it was at the time of the war uh, in Bos Bosnia and Serbia and Kosovo in the late 90s, and it revolved around the story of a boy who had been left for dead by his parents and thinking as a mother about what were the conditions that would allow her to, to do that. So in 1999, you might remember that this is when the NATO occupation began, just after the expulsion um, of, of Muslims and the invasion in, in Kosovo. At, <clears throat> this was a time that uh, the story kind of emerged. And it interested me in, in two ways. One, because the child was 18 months old. And if you remember in postpartum document, when he's starting to speak, well, perhaps I didn't mention that, it's around the 18 months. That's kind of classically when that starts. And so in the ballad, the child doesn't speak, which as it says here, he speaks not a word. This is a fragment, fragment from that. So when he was left for dead and he was found by Serbs and the Serbs, he, he was still alive. They uh, took him and, and they gave him a Serbian name. He couldn't speak, they, so they didn't know, <laughs> you know, who he was. And it was only kind of later that they, after the NATO occupation, that they abandoned him and gave him to the Kosovo Albanians who gave him another name, which was a heroic um, Kosovo name, Zoran. And then finally he was re reunited with his parents. And the first word that he says is bad, which is dad. So what you have kind of wrapped up here is this national allegory of freedom, you know, that how the child is used in that and how the patriarchal, you know, social formation always kind of um, shapes this discourse in the child. And then you have uh, something that kind of allowed me to say, yes, at this moment, the child's entry into language is so complicated by, by the, <clears throat> the impositions of, of the ethnic difference. And uh, <clears throat> in terms of the, uh, the story, <clears throat> also the, the interest that I have in, here's a real a separation of a traumatic kind, not what I'm talking about in, in um, the same sense as postpartum document, but it's the loss of the child actually in the condition of war. And you might remember that this is the time that the International War Crimes Tribunal 
that was being put in place. And I did a series of works before this of all about women and children in cases that were brought to the war crimes tribunal. And there's a line in the ballad. This is, she lays his body on the disbelieving ground, does not scream, does not look back, but, but vows, always, 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 I will think of him. So the, the kind of rhythm of her speech in the quote is very much a, like a translation. What struck me out of the entire story is that moment where she lays his body on, on the ground. The work is 250 feet, as you saw in the installation shot. It's just about the same length as the old fashioned 16 roll, millimeter roll of film. <laughs> so you've got a perfect 360 degree pan when you walk around and read the four stanzas. And I don't have time to kind of read you all the stanzas here, but I wanted to say that this was uh, also performed. And because as I said, it, it appears as this transverse sound wave and the voice running through as a rest line, I thought it could be sung. And it, Michael Nyman, the composer, who you probably know best for his music for the piano, that film, right? <clears throat> but it was a friend of mine in London who wanted to, to do a project of some kind with me. And when I did this work, I said, yes, this, this would work if you did a score for the exhibition, the way you do a score for, for a film. <clears throat> and so Sarah Leonard, who sings in a lot of Peter Greenaway's uh, films that Michael wrote the music for. I'll just play you just a little clip to get an idea of <clears throat> the elegiac sound of, of her voice and how the spectator actually would experience this work, which would be <clears throat> the um, quartet in the middle, as you see, and the spectators then can walk around and read the libretto as she's singing it. This was uh, <clears throat> taken during the rehearsal uh, with a handheld camera, you know, kind of walking, walking around and you could see that um, <clears throat> there, there are spaces in the work that kind of represent spaces in the, in the music as well. Um, <clears throat> and there was something which I particularly found, um, you know, productive about it when there was a live audience for it which are all the things you might call perishable materialities. <laughs> that is the kind of sounds and interactions of people that experience us as a community. I mean, something we're talking a lot about right now, about what it means to experience things as a community. But people would say that to me when they saw this. <clears throat> it was first performed at the Santa Monica Museum of Art, but it traveled, it went to the Cooper Union uh, Gallery, <clears throat> where I remember people saying, very much that it had that kind of sense of, um, <clears throat> I remembered or imagined, you know, community. And I did it in Mexico um, City too at MUCA, where Michael Nyman's particularly po popular. And there were so many people there that it took all, sucked the sound out of the room. <laughs> but we also did it in Spain in Murcia. It was translated, the ballad was translated in Spanish. Now I'm going to kind of move on. <clears throat>
this project, which I started as long ago as 2004, but <clears throat> kept working on it until 2017, was what I thought of as my wide angle view <laughs> of history. Um, and as far as I dared to go and see how I, as a feminist in my kind of history, you know, described a certain kind of era. And again, this is a, a kind of different notion of the mother-child relationship. It's one that I would call like the generational connection or the intergenerational um, project because it was brought to my attention by my students. <clears throat> uh, it, was, it was first in the, around the time of the second Gulf War in 2004 uh, that they began kind of asking things about 1968. And in fact, I saw a slogan on the university's wall that said, stop the war, have sex. <laughs> so if any of you are old enough to remember that it was make love, not war, you'd think, well, they got it sort of right, but not quite. <laughs> and I found that, um, you know, there would this uh, in some of the demonstrations that there'd be slogans that people brought out from the 60s, there'd be clothes, it's similar. <clears throat> and I started to realize, you know, perhaps from a psychoanalytic perspective, that there is something about it that is like a primal scene. It's like that what Freud says, a child wonders, where did I come from? But if you expand that beyond the family narrative to the um, the grand kind of social historical narrative, where did I come from? You get something I would call the political primal scene. <laughs> and so that's what really interested me. It's like, yes, they were born then. So they intuitively think they know something about it. But they're also intrigued by that enigma of parental desire. You know, what is it that my parents did? What do they want me to do? And then it just kind of clicked what Walter Benjamin says about there being a secret agreement between this generation and <clears throat> the past one. He says, because it's always, you know, something missed that presents itself, um, it bears on the present and, and the future. This, this feeling. And now I feel I finish this in 217, but what we're living through right now, <laughs> absolutely. You know, again, what was missed in the early civil rights movement, what bears on the present and the future, absolutely kind of driving that, that kind of repetition. So this was like where I began. And as you move through the installation, the second work, these are, I'll, I'll just explain them technically in a bit. But the second one is another very iconic image from uh, the Second World War, uh, a bombed out site in London after the, the Blitz. And then if you move to, through the installation to the next, you see that one, which is based on Tahrir Square and the kind of shots that you get on your, your cell phone at the time of this kind of swirling constellation of, of, of people. When the women that I knew at that time were asking me about 68, I went back to my archive and got this photo from 68, which was taken by Jean-Pierre Ray in Paris in 1968, the day before the general strike. You know, it's so iconic, so well known. It's Carolyn de Brendon, she's hoisting the Vietnamese flag and she's on the shoulders of Jean-Jacques Lebel, who is one of the leaders of the occupation of the Odeon. They know that, that kind of moment. And I thought it's just before the women's movement. And it's not as though you wanted to be that kind of cliched muse for the revolution there. It's that I wanted to be in the position of the photographer. Right? So there, there was that interesting transition. Now, in terms of the medium, you can imagine these are between eight and 10 feet by 11 and, and 12. These are history painting scale. 
and the technique, as you can see, it's still made up of the lint units. But now the challenge was to vectorize the image so that I could apply it to the filter screen of the dryer and, and cast it. It's really cast as the lint blows through, it accumulates around the, the vinyl. And then it's pressed into a card as it comes out. And there's nothing drawn on it or, or changed at all. It's just an assisted ready-made. It's just the lint from the dryer pressed into the card, right? So Mary, in a way, it's like a screen print almost. It's the same sort of idea of your blocking areas. That's right. But because there's depth, it's also a little bit like a casting process. Yes. Yeah, yes. Chipping it out. I've never been sure which one to, <laughs> to call it. <clears throat> so th this is the way that it, it, it builds up the image. Now, for me, as you, you could guess from following me be before, when I use the concept of duration, more as diegetic time in a cinematic way, uh, and you had to walk through it. Here, what I've done is to bring out that kind of notion of time in the time it takes to produce this. You know, it's built up in units, maybe over 10 months or six months and 10,000 pounds of washing. You know, so there's a, there's a kind of ritual of the production of this in time. And then in the installation view that you saw, uh, you, you kind of notice a different tone, which I imagine when you first saw it, you thought perhaps it's a video projection. And so <clears throat> what I did with the lint is to project just what they call light noise or static onto the surface, which does mean that when you go in, you think, what am I looking at, right? You know, is this a cinematic image, right? And then when you get up close, it just kind of dissolves. It's about this materiality. So in, in some way, you know, I don't really need to say more about <laughs> our suspicions in terms of how we remember history because it's kind of embedded <laughs> in the work, so to speak. In, in terms of uh, the, the time that this was, was produced, there is a kind of, for me, a, a way that it, it maps through the various kind of slogans of the time. And I just wanted to mention one in particular was no right to speak without Les Anquettes or without Le, the interrogations. There was a certain moment of saying that only, you know, with questioning and listening, was there a right to kind of speak. And I think that this is an underlying, very fundamental part of the procedures of all conceptual art and artists that came out of that moment. So um, in this one, uh, the photograph was October 1940 during the Blitz in London. This became a very iconic image of resistance almost, people kind of reading in the devastated library. But there's another kind of history that was interesting to me here, which is that this library was at that time the private collection of Lord Ilchester, you know, before, before the war. All the, it included things like the Boxer Codex, an original manuscript of Racine. So it was kind of all the colonial spoils that were represented in this, this moment. And interestingly, kind of after the war, it became a public space. So <clears throat> just kind of a reminder of, of, of what those, what that war was about. That was the moment when I was born. Just um, Pearl Harbor was six months <laughs> after I was born. And I thought because I never, never gave this consideration before the young women asked me about 68. And then I thought, you know, why have I never asked that question about where I came from? And I think there's a certain arrogance we had in 68 of thinking, how could they have let this happen? Something like the Holocaust, like the war, you know, our generation will, will change it, will we'll make it <laughs> happen. So that was um, 
one of the reasons that I went to this image, but just a technical challenge here that you might be interested in is I wanted to be able to establish some perspective for this so that you would feel that you were looking into the building and that bombed out um, ceiling, the way the light came in. So I, I started for the first time using different colored cards to press the lint into. So we have a lighter gray area that you see towards the middle, and then a silver background that, the, that it's, goes on in, in the middle section, which is why it looks kind of more illuminated. Yes, it's just kind of showing, the, the, again, the detail of, <clears throat> of the lint. And it's very laborious, this kind of washing and drying. But I have to tell you a funny story. I thought I could speed it up by getting uh, towels that produce more fluff, but it didn't, <laughs> it didn't work. So it, it turned out that it has to be just very old black cotton, you know, to get a very fine residue, white and white and black. I moved into color kind of later, but it has to be, it really was my clothes to start with, which is part of, you know, what was good about the idea of the residue and how you work through something. Like, how do you deal with trauma? How do you deal with the past? How do, it's so ephemeral. And I just thought I have to make this medium work because it's the only thing that expresses it in the right way for me. And so with my amazing partner, we had to figure out a lot of details, like it has to always be dried on cool, right? You have to use lime to keep it from, from sticking, kind of dust it up. Um, and just, you know, a lot of tweaking, you know, to get it to the level I, I felt, you know, good about. And, and, and how, how did, how, I mean, this is not a medium that I know other people work in. So how did you, I mean, I think of you now every time I wash and dry my clothes, but how did you come to think about using the lint? Uh, the story is that, well, I was just doing other things in the, in the kitchen when I heard the tele, on the television, there was a South African woman talking about the way that her son was arrested and shot at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And it was the beginning of all of my thinking about the trauma and that we're not separate from it, that it's filtering through into our everyday life. We're not separate from it. And doing the washing at the same time. And I said to Ray, because how can I deal with that? How do you deal? I'm, this is a perfect material. We have to make that work. I mean, it was the coming together of you know, those inputs from everyday life and the world, <laughs> you know, and at that time. So this, this image of, of Trapper Square, probably you remember seeing things on your um, cell phone that just looked like this swirling kind of constellation. I used the same silver ground, the card, that I used in the center of the, the circa 1940. So it gives it that kind of luminosity. And for me, it was this kind of very transcendent image, even though it was anonymous from a photographer's point of view. You see the kind of tents in the middle, but the red uh, are much like the way they do things in the news, right? <laughs> they marked different spots. If you go clockwise from the entrance, that would be the main campsite. <laughs> and then if you go up to the top two red ones, there would be the vendors sites coming down would be the the uh, child care center the crash coming towards the middle the bloggers site going up again to where the the water was kept and um, coming down the wall of martyrs going over to the right the tanks waiting and coming down to the next one the um, medical center, the makeshift medical center, and then back towards here, uh, the call to prayer. You can kind of see what looks like praying bodies down there if you try. You can see the slogans. The people demand the removal of the regime. You can see a bit of it in reverse there. It's in both English and Arabic. It appears in the, in the story. 
to kind of fill out this notion of history that I was dealing with, I did a series of covers from a magazine called Seven Days. I reproduced the covers of magazines that I worked on in the early 70s. The Seven Days project was a feminists and non-aligned men on the left that thought we could do a weekly newspaper that looked like life <laughs> and had lots of photographs and was completely committed to parity for women, to feminism, to the trade union movement, the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement. And so it was a very utopian project. It only lasted a year <laughs> uh, because of, of course it wasn't financially solvent which is something very interesting to think about in the current context. I mean, just the, the amount of support for the protests now and how generationally divided it was at this time in 68 in terms of a general public, you know, for something like a newspaper. But I just want to give you a couple examples. Now, my reason for moving from those, the large iconic history work images there to this tiny little minuscule observation of, of uh, the stories in advance of, of every day, that I thought that was another way to understand history, right? Is to see it in this sense. So I think this one, this is particularly interesting to people who might try to read it. And it says the African rioter. And you think, hmm. That, that doesn't sound right, does it? Like it should be more specific. But of course it isn't because that was Rhodesia. And the, and the, and the uh, activists there refused that name. You could not call them Rhodesia because it was the early the white settler state. And it was one of the first things supported by the newly formed ANC this moment in, in 1972, which was so important. If you move to the next one, which is my personal kind of favorite because I, I worked on it. This is an interview we did with Simone de Beauvoir where she said her famous lines about, finally, I'm a feminist, she said. And I think, you know, even though the women's movement is not autonomous from the big and many struggles that we're involved in, it still needs to be separate. It was like the green light for us as feminists who were very interested in what's now called intersectionality. Uh, and that is the feminist then who thought, yes, you know, we can't separate this from what's going on in terms of, of civil rights, the war movement and the trade union movement. This particular march was the abortion rights march in Paris in 1972. Likewise, this moment, which was Right after the Attica uprisings, this was taken at a, a prison in Houston in 1971. But just at that time, it, and before the very first meeting of the prisoners union, I think in Los Angeles in that year. And the next one was the probably of our era, the first and most infamous case of genocide. <laughs> which was in Pakistan in 71 when they expelled the Bengali nationals from West Bengal, you know, to East Bengal, that then became Bangladesh. But 10 million people in a week and 30 million, you know, um, displaced subsequently. And I just wanted to, you know, to point out, even though these mark such specific moments, that the repetitions are impossible to ignore in every case, you know, that I've given you. <clears throat> now there was one more thing I thought needed to be done <laughs> to address this question of history. And of course, because as a feminist, I say the personal is political. I had to, to include the, the letters. I have News From Home, the series I call News From Home. Now, I think at least some of you are old enough, like me, to know this is an areogram. None of the younger people know what this is anymore. <laughs> the letter that you could write on and then mail. And this one that was uh, sent to me in 1972 by my brother, 
who was involved in the anti-war movement. And he's talking about all the, the problems of just surviving from day to day, uh, trying to experiment with different ways of living and then going on these demonstrations during the Nixon administration and the escalation of the war at that time. You see, I got all the details in here. I have to point out like the Kennedy stamp and all that getting those in the, in the lint medium is a challenge, of course. But um, I also started to use color. So in a, in a way that was more radical than the ones you've seen before, because I thought the letters sort of allowed me to do that. So I, do, I did use a blue towel as well. And I used, lot, I used different card grounds. So you might see a black and a white wash on top of a, a gray card, or you might see a white and a blue <laughs> wash on top of a black card. The next detail is a, a letter that was sent to me by a friend in Beirut, which is um, always makes me laugh when I read it. She's saying, you know, how we thought we could live our lives like Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir, but it's it's not working out because the person in the marginal relation is not happy. <laughs> and so it, it kind of goes through the way that we were trying, uh, <clears throat> trying so hard to confront this heterosexual imperative and different, you know, forms of family and experiment with free association, you know, as well as different ways of living. This is 1974. The one from 1970 was written by a friend from Beirut, where I lived for um, nearly four years. And the, fir the first one was 1972. And the humor actually, I think, allows me in the letters to, to use the color as well. <clears throat> so here I, I've used a red towel <laughs> and, and different permutations. But this was a letter that in our com communal living situation that we set up as feminists and all the guys who lived with us and have to follow the work schedule <laughs> that we put up. She, she's writing to me when I'm away and saying, everything is fine. She's talking about the meeting she's doing. My son is writing on her letter. You can see at the same time as she's trying to do that, and then her child is writing me a letter too in the second one. She says, everything's fine, don't worry. And her child says, mommy just about burned the house down. <laughs> Three fire trucks came to the house and she lost her wallet. <laughs> and so it just, it kind of captures something of the confusion, the excitement, the experimentation and the, just the domesticity, you know, of the scene. And so what, at the time I did this work, Perhaps, I mean, I think of the letters as the most evocative references to this notion of the practical past. That is not just, as Hayden White writes about this, it's not just the past of, of dreams and memory, but it's the past as problem solving and tactics for living. And my question when I did this work at the time was, what is it of the tactics of living that, if any, that have been passed on to the present of the feminist kind of attempts to non-hierarchical organization of different forms of family, of free association, these things. Uh, but I can say that was 217 and now we're living in the moment of 220, which is undeniably imprinted, you know, with the, with the legacy of that moment. When you were producing it, you know, did you have that dialectic of it being something very personal, but also very consciously documenting women's experience? Or how did you, how did you come to, how were you thinking about it in that, in that moment? Well, as I say, documentation, I use myself as a subject to experiment with, to see what this was about, right? So that was, that was, um, <clears throat> One way, and I used the warts and all diary style, <laughs> just you know, as it, as I went through, as it, uh, and the found objects that just presented themselves at the different in the different moments. But is, that isn't all there was to the document. It also had the the footnotes and the diagrams, 
So it was also kind of fr framing the work within these discourses of pediatrics or art or linguistics or, and, and asking the question about how does this fit? You know, what I was really interested in is the way all the guys would say they love the theory and they hate the stuff. <laughs> and all the women would say they like the stuff and they hate the theory because it's male dominated. And I was trying to show there isn't some simplistic idea of woman's experience. You know, that we, you know, there's this and we're also trying to think through these things, trying to change our lives. And at that time, really practically changing it, changing the law but at the same time, writing the theory that wasn't there before. And those were all as important in a way as the obvious nature of looking, looking after the, the child. So it was really to kind of contest that essentialism about women's experience. And I have to say, I was so taken that you went as a young woman in the 60s to teach art in Lebanon of all places. That wasn't something I think of people, a place I think of people going um, very often, certainly not when they're in their 20s um, right. as a young woman. Right. Um, although I know I, I grew up at it, with it at a very different time, but I was curious to know, was that experience, did that inform your sort of awareness of parallel incidents and experiences across nationalities in a, in a different way than it might have if you hadn't? It was during a time in, in Beirut, which was uh, before fundamentalism. And it had an unbelievable intellectual culture of people, you know, that very connected to France. And so that's where I, you know, read Sartre and Fanon and, and the books from the Gallimard Press and Cahiers du Cinema. And, you know, there was a, it was such an international environment. It was connected to people in London, Paris, as well as, you know, Beirut. And it was a tremendous influence on you know, my life and work. Were most of your other um, faculty from other places as well? Or were there a lot of Americans there? With yes. your, I mean, teaching? Yeah, lots of Americans. It was a typical, you know, colonial situation. <laughs> and I was there during the 67 war. Wow. And only, <clears throat> so, so I kind of know something about those conditions of war. But um, <clears throat> when I moved to the work that you think of as being kind of less personal, in a way, yeah. well, I don't necessarily think of it that way because it's the questions that emerge. It's, uh, my way into those works was really as a mother, right? Of thinking about that experience, but thinking about it in relation to other women. And I think it's the big question that has come more and more to the fore. We can't just say all women are united, all circumstances are the same. You know, that there's, there's a, a way that you have into it, but then you have to understand the difference of the other. And all my, my works, I would say when you brought up the question or the idea of witnessing, that really is so central because I, my project, if I could describe it in a few words, would just be that I wanted to be a witness to the passage of a few women through a very brief period of time, <laughs> as Guy de Boer would say, uh, but just to show how we evolved, how one question led to another, and that made that, you know, that passage that we call feminism. I remember when I did the first um, you know, works about the war crime tribunal. You know, Linda Nachman did ask me, she said, well, what happened to feminism? And of course, this was at the moment when it was being challenged for its isolation, you know, in terms of issues. I know that you have talked a lot about your um, pedagogical practice and your sort of feminist pedagogical practice um, where you very much um, atypically from anybody who's had a studio crit, you sort of, instead of having a student present their work, you have the other classmates 
look at the work first before mm -hmm. they're they're given any information by the student. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah, and that's a that's a typical thing that I would describe as a tactic. You know, it's feminism as a tactic, not a content. Right. Not teaching content, but it's a something passed on from our early consciousness raising groups was that you didn't speak for others and that you listen. And I thought, you know, one of the problems with the way artists look at other artists' work is that they're just thinking, they're projecting. And that you need to be in a different place as a viewer. You need to look as a form of listening to what that artist is saying, right? So it just evolved over the years, this kind of careful process of, I'm looking as listening. <laughs> when you talk about um, working with your students and the importance of looking at something, but you're mm. looking at words too. And I'm just, you know, I, I'm curious about how you go back and forth, even in just what we just looked at with the Circa trilogy, it's all image really. There's no text with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, and it's on a very grand scale. And so mm. it's, and, okay. and well, particularly- it's Important yeah. point for me to, to make here. I don't make that distinction because text is is an image for me. And and I always say to students when they're looking at work with text, don't read it. Not for a long time. Look at everything else first because our assumptions about the written word are based on it being, you know, having a code. So we think we understand it. And so the minute you read it, you kind of close down, right? But there's, a, for me, it's a, a kind of uh, getting the texture of the voice. You know, all these letters, I had to vectorize that individual handwriting. It's that voice, that kind of texture. And interestingly, in the other works, like the ballad where I was doing writing, you have to leave out all the adjectives almost because the, the visuals, the, lint, the stuff is acting as an adjective, right? I wanted to be sure that we had a chance, particularly um, because it's so salient in this moment, um, to look at the work that we acquired in 2018. And it's quite an extraordinary work. Again, like um, your circuit trilogy, very large in scale, four feet by seven feet, I believe, each mm -hmm. postcard. Mm -hmm. There are just three postcards in the series. It's this Ours is called My James. And people will note that it's addressed to James Earl Cheney, um, who was one of the three activists involved in the Freedom Summer um, in Mississippi. He was assassinated when he was working with them to sign, uh, yes. get people to there sign up to vote. Three of them, Cheney and Michael Schwerner and Andrew Goodman. Yeah. And they were all murdered in 1964. Ku Klux Klan members that were indicted were all let go. In 2005, they finally convicted uh, Killen, who was the instigator, who, as the mother of James Cheney says, got sent up for 60 years. So finally there's some justice. So what happened when I made this work is that um, I read that uh, Goodman had sent his mother a postcard that was only minutes before he was murdered. And, and I imagine that in 2005, the mother writing back, all the mother and the, and the brother in the case of Schwerner, you know, marking this justice so many, many years later that some justice had occurred. It was very much there things they said in their interviews. I didn't change their way of speaking, but I used my handwriting because I wanted it to be clear that it was filtered through me again. It was through this, the empathy that I had with them. With them. But I wasn't appropriating. It, it had a certain fictional nature to it as well. The stamps are from the time right that you see in the postcards yes and things that occur like the foundation they really exist on each card yes these are things that do exist and all the stamps for the dates and where they come from are the locations where 
the mothers and the, the brother where the, where they are. So the, the, there's a kind of um, close attention to the documentary quality of it as, as well. But you know, when I did the love songs works and then moved into the Serpa 1968 piece and uh, you know, thinking through the legacy of feminism and things, I, I had a very profound feeling of how, well, you know how cyclical history is. And the first wave of feminism came out of civil rights. It was through people working back with the freedom uh, writers, as they were called, in, in the early 60s that we started to think of ourselves as, oh, in the same or, or some, you know, similar position. And, and it, again, you see the way that issues of race are treated after the feminist movement reflect that as well because then there's a challenge to things like positive images and sexism and all of that added to it. But at this time, um, I, I was at the, the famous March on Washington in 1963. Uh, so not just Paris 68, but there was 63. I was there. I know Martha Rossler and I often look at that famous photograph and try to find ourselves. <laughs> but not that I remember much that was being said, but I, I remember profoundly the people I met and that I kept in touch with for a while. But they were on their way to the South, right? And I was on my way to get a boat from New York to Genoa to go to school in Florence. <laughs> and there was, you know, a motivation to kind of go back and to mark how important that period was for me. So the, so, but, and then, so in approaching this then, I mean, you cert, you had, you know, you were coming at it from your interest in motherhood and those kinds of ties and mm -hmm. disconnections and things that happen. Um, but you're also in, in the, the particular case of my James, it's also you're assuming a pers specific person that lived and she was also of a different ethnicity. And did you take, did you think about that at all when you were doing it? Or were you really coming more from, you know, the connection of motherhood or how were you thinking about that? You know, in, in all those ways, of course. And, and it's, it's the one I worried about the most in establishing the voice. And I still worry to this day whether she would have put two kisses at the end. This is ongoing. I would like to kind of make an argument against the kind of essentialism in the sense of this authentic subject, right, of the work. <clears throat> but I, I don't think that that means that anybody can do anything, right? Well, I was as careful as I could possibly be to acknowledge, you know, the handwriting, where it came from. And I'll end it there. Thank you, Mary. I mean, for a really fascinating talk and, and insight into your process and, and your work. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you so much, Mary.